Hello and welcome to the Care It Out Sleep Show, a podcast for Thai parents who are searching for a bit more sleep the caring way. I'm your host, Kerry Secker, infant sleep consultant, founder of my unique sleep approach to Care It Out and your caring sleep supporter. I really hope you'll join me on my mission to get small to settle night's sleep without the tears, training or techniques. I love talking about sleep and I can't wait to share my sleep subjects with you. My approach to getting you more sleep is simple, straightforward, but above all, it's got to make sense and feel best for you. Ready to get more sleep? Then let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Carrot Out Sleep Show. You are listening to your host, Carrie Secker, and I hope you're really well and holding up in this heat. It is really, really hot. If you are listening to this in the future, that always makes me laugh a little bit. It seems a little bit weird that we can find trouble like that. It is August 2020 in the UK and it is absolutely blazing and it's in its 30s. It's in its 30s and everybody is sweating. So I hope you're holding up. And today I'm really, I mean, I look forward to every single episode of the podcast, but I'm really looking forward to this podcast episode because I'm going to be joined by a parent, a mum, that one, you might remember a while back, I did a competition for when the Carrot Out Sleep Show turned a year. I can't believe we're a year old already. Time goes very, very quickly. And I ran a competition for one listener to come and talk to me and have a consultation live on the podcast. And this episode is today. And I'm really looking forward to introducing her, talking through her daughter, and hopefully um, you will find it very useful as well. So today I'm going to be talking to Abby. How are you, Abby? Morning. Good morning. Thank you. How are you? Welcome to yes, the sleep show. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Thank you. I am really, really excited. I thought it was such a lovely little competition, um, and I, I feel I always feel competitions always make me feel bad. I'm always really happy for the winner, the person that actually gets to prize, whatever that is. But then I always feel for everybody. I wish I could do it for everybody that entered. Um, but Abby, your name came up. Um, generated at random you were the lucky winner and here you are thank you so much for coming on thank you for having me I feel very lucky and I feel a bit guilty to everybody that entered as well <laughs> no you I think you can't think like that because yeah you honestly you won it fair and square and yeah. there'll be definitely more comp- there's definitely more comp- in fact I'm running another one today blatant plug for the 25k giveaway and um, we reached 25k on Instagram I think, oh, wow. last weekend or the weekend before so I've got a really big giveaway planned today so there's plenty of opportunity but today Abby it is all about you and your daughter Thea oh, and if anybody knows me and um, they will know that she is a sleep snatcher and I feel like I do deserve this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love that. Well, what we're going to do is I am going to run it a little bit like how I would a normal consultation. And I'm sure you've got lots of questions for me as um, things that you want to share. I definitely know that I've got lots of questions and things I want to share with you too. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do, <clears throat> excuse me, a brief summary of your sleep story because I think sometimes people... But one, it's important for me to um, go through her sleep story, find out more about her. I'm always very passionate that you are, uh, I need to call it Abby, you are Thea's expert every single time. I like to say that I don't know it all. I know a lot about sleep, but I don't know it all. You are her expert. And what I do have is lots of experience and expertise to share with you. And I've definitely got lots of questions and lots of things I want to share with you too. I think what I tend to do is I split the session into three parts. One is I'm just going to go through her sleep story to get what I need to sum it all up for you, make sure you know exactly what's happening. I've got the, the bed background, as I like to talk, as I like to say. And also for anybody listening, I think sometimes it's handy to know those key little bits because hopefully that can help um, some people put some, some of the sleep suggestions in place if it's relevant for them. Then I never like to assume to presume that families come onto a call or a consultation and know lots about sleep in general, me, my approach. Um, it's I Families come on and, and talk to me at very different stages of their sleep journey. So I'll just spend a little bit of time with you, Abby, seeing whether you've got any questions there. And then the last part of the section, the majority of the session what we're going to do is work through her four sleep steps to test my sleep and the aim we were talking about 
or Abby, is that I really want to give you some really sensible and solid sleep suggestions that you can go and put in place at home to hopefully improve her sleep, sleep snatcher. And hopefully anybody listening, poor Sia, and then anybody listening, hopefully that will be useful for them. Too. How does that sound? Perfect. Cool. Do you have any questions so far, Abby? Uh, no, not yet. I'm sure there'll be lots. <laughs> they'll come. I'm sure. <laughs> um, cool. So, Thea is 15 months, is that right? Yes, she was one in April. That seems a long time ago now, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> this year's a very strange year. Very strange year. And I'm just triple checking, nothing's changed. So there's no weight concerns, no reflux, no allergies. And she's in, she's in grand health. She is. She's a very healthy baby. Uh, amazing. I'm always happy to hear that. I think it's, I'm always very honest. I think it's very important for parents to hear this, is that I'm not medically qualified. I work with the biological side of infant sleep, which is something completely different. And I believe that practitioners and sleep consultants, whoever, you know, nutritionists we all have a duty of care to stay in our scope of practice so what i would say about this not medically qualified always honest and upfront about this i don't feel there's anything we need to take into consideration for um the sleep i'm quite confident it's biological that's great because that's a side of sleep i actually work with and also coming back to staying in scope of practice if i thought at all like i would never give a diagnosis of reflux or um or allergies i'm just not qualified and experienced to give advice on those on those subjects so if i felt there was anything that could impact her sleep overall or get into your sleep aims or I felt that it was outside my scope of practice, I would 100% say, and if appropriate, I would pass you on to the appropriate practitioner as well. If it's medical, I'm not going to advise, I'm going to um, suggest you speak to your <coughs> doctor or health visitor or nurse, practice nurse. If I thought it was a food issue, I would send you on to a nutritionist or um, a lactation consultant. I wouldn't, if it if it wasn't something that I thought I was qualified to um, give advice on, I would definitely pass it on. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. I think, I think that's so important for parents to hear that exactly. because I think sometimes there's this expectation that sleep consultants know everything and have all of the answers. And I'm really honest and upfront, Abby, as you know, I yeah. don't have all the answers. I'm not qualified in everything. I think everybody just needs to stay in their zone of genius, as I like to call it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Cool. And she's a good little eater. She has three meals a day and she eats something at most meals, would you say? She does, yeah. And I think tea time's probably the time that she would eat the most. Yeah, no, amazing. Um, and I'm just triple checking nothing's changed. So she's sleeping in her own room in a cot bed. Yes, on a night, yeah. On a night. During the day, she naps in her pushchair. No, that makes sense. I'm going to come on to naps. And I'm just, I'm just checking because, again, assumption is often the mother will mess up. So I've learned that different things different, mean different things to different parents. Um, but when you say cot bed, she's got the sides off of the, like it's a floor mattress. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so one side's been taken off so she can get in and out of her bed herself. That makes sense and no dummy and but she's got a jelly cup uh, bunny <clears throat> yeah and but she, she does she does cuddle that now she does cuddle it yeah it's always been in the cot with her but she's never really bothered with it up until maybe the last couple of weeks where she does she does snuggle with it when she's falling yeah. to sleep I think comforters are comforters are one of those things aren't they Abby that I think are pushed as you've got to introduce a comforter to um to get them to fall asleep independently or it's going to help with sleep and yeah. there's a couple of things here one is again i i stay away from suggesting a comforter one because well um thea is um over 12 months now which so it's it's safer to have something in the cot but i do stick to sid's guidelines that an empty cot is a safe cot so that's one reason why i wouldn't suggest them yeah. but again i think as long as as long as parents are making an informed choice there's a, i feel that there's a risk to everything we do nothing is completely risk-free even sitting here at our desk today talking to you there's 
there's always something associated with it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so that's one reason why I, I don't suggest You've cursed us now. I'm going to spill my water <laughs> off and put it on the tablet. Oh. <laughs> We're going to get it off. No, 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 don't say that. Don't say that. I did that the other day. I threw coffee. No, it was milk. And I really hate milk all over my laptop. And I just cleaned oh, it. Oh, no. Great. But yes, that's one reason why I tend to stay away from suggesting companies is because yeah. under 12 months an empty pot is a safe pot and also um comfort i like to say comforters don't always cut it like i don't believe that if your baby needs a feed if Thea needs a feed she needs you she needs physical reassurance from you however cute that comforter is and belly cat bunnies are extremely cute it isn't <laughs> going to cut it but for some, give it a little bit of time, they do start snuggling with it. And yeah. it can be a useful tool. So if you're going on holiday or you're going to nursery or they're sleeping somewhere else, it can be a useful tool. But I think comforters are a real, I think they're a real personal uh, personal choice there. Just wanted to yeah. share that. Now I think there's a the fear of losing it as well, <laughs> isn't there? If you've got one particular comforter, if you lose it, then it's, if yeah. they haven't got an attachment to it, that's a bit of a worry. Yeah, um, <coughs> a really good tip about that is buy three or four or ten <laughs> <laughs> comforters. Do you know how you much jelly, co jelly cats cost, Kerry? <laughs> I didn't realise how expensive they were. <laughs> Ridiculously <laughs> expensive. I think anything baby, it's like a wedding, anything baby yeah. related is expensive. Um, business to be in. But yeah, don't be that person, this was me, who was about to board a transatlantic flight with two children on her, this is from my nannying days, on her own, and I dropped the, the beloved Barbar, the comforter, in the airport, mm. and once we got on the plane, we realised we had to go 10 hours without his Barbar. <laughs> oh, the longest flight ever then. Do you know what? It wasn't that bad. He just kept going to pull Barbara on his own. I was like, I know. <laughs> He'll be having all the... I just, I tried to make it into positive. Like, I know you're sad. We've lost it. It's it's horrible, isn't it, when we lose something we love. Um, but I was like, think of all the adventures he's having and all the people yeah. he's going to meet. And actually, the his mum was on the later flight coming out. She had to fly out later. And she actually saw him at the airport and brought Barbara back with her. Oh, that's amazing. I know. So, yes. <laughs> Don't get those comforters out in the airport. I knew, <laughs> do you know what? I knew he was... I always pack it away before going through security. And I knew getting... I, I even said, I think, you know, if we get it out, we're going to lose him. But he was so upset. And I thought, in that moment, you've got to pick your battles, haven't you? I was like, right, lose the comforter. Get everybody through security. Get on the plane. Don't miss it. And, yeah. I oh, love the story. I could write a book about nannying, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Naps I'm going to come back to you and talk to you about because they're one of my four sleep steps. And mm -hmm. the same with the bedtime routine. And then your sleep aims, what you would like to get out of this session is to reduce the amount of time fear wakes up overnight. Yeah, most yeah. definitely. Amazing. This is actually, I just want to reassure you, this is actually quite a common aim, if you can believe that. <laughs> I, I read that a lot. And I like it because one, it's really to the point. Um, you just like to reduce the amount of wake ups overnight or the period of time she's awake for. And the other thing is, I really do feel that's realistic and achievable. Um, we spoke before, like if, if, for anybody listening, we had a bit of a Abby and I had a pre chat. This isn't the first time we've spoken because we just wanted to make sure what what I wanted to make sure what Abby felt comfortable sharing with you. Um, and how it was all going to run. So I'm not going to go all through the nights, but we, we, when we spoke before Abby, we did, you know, we came to the conclusion that Thea isn't at her biological best at the moment, um, and we do feel there's room for improvement, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a massive believer in that if it's, I'm always going to go to reassurance first, I think. I feel that's always my first port of call, reassurance first then we make changes if we need to. And I'm not going to stop sharing that message that it's really, really, because I think parents need to hear, you need to hear it. And I think it's really important that it is normal and natural for them to wake up for babies, any age or stage to wake up, have needs at night, have feeds at night time. And if that's working for you and you're small, 100% all is well, you don't need to change it. I'm also of the other end of the spectrum. For me, life is definitely about balance. Don't always achieve it, mind. Um, but I always try to strive for balance. 
And on balance, if those frequent wake-ups are unsustainable, they're not working for you, they're not working for your family, they're super frequent, then chances are changes can be made with care. And I do feel your flea pains are realistic and achievable. I'm always extremely honest, again, that um, I don't, I know I said if I had a magic wand um, on the form, because I really want to know what parents are hoping or what you are hoping to get out of working together or speaking together. But unfortunately, I don't have a magic wand. I'm sure you know that, Abby. <laughs> so, it's a lot of pressure for one person, but I don't have a magic wand. Um, I oh, wish yeah. I did. I really wish I, I know. I really wish I did at times. But I do feel your sleep pains are realistic and achievable. And again, I'm really honest. I wouldn't, I know it's a bit of a pain. It's a real process having to go through your, um, send in your sleep story with me via the website, wait for a response, wait for me to get back to you. Sometimes I have to initiate a chat before going on to paid sleep service. But it actually works in your favour because by the time then we've got to going on to a sleep service, and I know this is a, you want a competition, but most families that speak to me, it's a paid consultation. I only ever want to go near a paid consultation if I'm quietly confident that I'm, a, I'm, you need a sleep consultant or a consultation. You just don't need a bit of reassurance. B, I'm the best sleep supporter for you. You feel that I'm a good fit for your family because everybody's approach is completely different. And personality is different as well. I think it's a bit like dating, it's got a match. And then also, I'm quietly confident that your sleep ends are realistic and achievable because there is, even with sleep training, there's no guarantee or given do this, do that. This is what's going to happen because. Babies, smalls, families, life, um, there's too many variables, but I'm quietly confident that she's not at her biological best and I really do feel we can reduce the amount of time she wakes up overnight. How does that sound? Amazing. And what I would really like to do afterwards, and we'll have a chat about this afterwards, Abby, if you're up for it, and I promise you next time, for anybody listening, we've had a bit of a, it's been a bit of a journey getting us to this point, hasn't it, Abby? <laughs> we arranged it last week and then I had a bit of a mix up with my earphones. Tech and me do not go very well. Um, but I promise it'll be smoother next time. We made it today, which is the most important thing. But if you're up for it again, it would be lovely to have you back on and go through how, like, have a, like, an Abbey catch up. Like, how did it work? What worked? What didn't work? Have you made it through? That'd be brilliant. That sounds brilliant. Love that. We can talk about it. There's no pressure. We can talk about it later yeah cool do you have any questions so far abby yeah no i don't think so it's all made sense yeah yeah good it's got to make sense cool well before we crack on and go through her four sleep steps and make some suggestions for you did you as i mentioned before really hate assumption me it's often the mother of all my cuts when i assume things and i never seem to learn um but did you have any questions, like general questions about sleep, um, about Thea's sleep, about me, my approach, my theory to sleep? Anything at all there? No, I think I follow you on Instagram. So I feel as if I know your approach quite well. Um, you always post really relatable um, stories and um, ideas um, for everybody to, to see. So no, I think I feel like I know you pretty well. So I'm Amazing. raring to go. I really, honestly, that brings me so much joy. My belly flipped. That brings me so <laughs> much joy. It's not that you know me. It's just having that starting point that you, you're on board. Like, you know that you've got that theory there because the theory is pretty much... Sleep is, is a biological process. So the theory behind infant sleep or small sleep, that's the same for pretty much... You could apply that to adults. So you could apply that to every baby or small toddler so I use the word smaller it encompasses everybody from newborn to aged eight um I forgot where I was with that <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'd lose track I got my brain to go to today. what was I talking about you were saying because I said that oh, I follow the... you on Instagram so you yes. said that you're glad that I kind of have some idea of yeah how you work it's the theory yeah so the theory is the same for everybody but the beauty of a consultation working one-to-one -one, yep you are completely right abby as parents always are in my book um 
Mm-hmm. I do try and share a lot on Instagram. I often feel guilty that I don't share enough because I've just got, so, I could sit on there all day and I don't think I would ever be bored. I've got so much to share. <laughs> I also have a job to do. Um, but I do share a lot. And sometimes I think parents worry that that's just scratching, like, well, she shares so much. What's that, what's left to give in a consultation? But actually yeah. the real beauty of one-to-one is that for a lot of families like yourself, Abby, they've got the theory there. So they've got a sound knowledge of sleep. They've got the theory. Some families might even have an idea of what they, um, where they're going to be working on, what they, um, what they think I'm going to say. Some already come on and go, I know what I need to do. I just need confirmation. We're all really mm-hmm. different. Um, but the beauty yeah. is I can get to a one-to-one and is that I can get to speak to you, the as expert, every single time. And it's so much easier to make very tailored, specific sleep suggestions that can make a big difference. Once yeah. I've got sleep story, I'm speaking to you, their expert. And I've also got Thea as, as a guide. She, the babies, the families tell me everything I need to know. It's not, that's, it's not the other way around. A lot of families think I'm going to be telling them what they need to know. And sometimes I do. Sometimes I do get a bit bossy. I get really into it. And I'm like, yep, try this, try that, do this. Um, actually, it's usually the other way around. It's me listening to you. I know I'm doing a lot of talking, but I do listen, I promise, at times. Um, <laughs> I listen to you and what's going on, what isn't working for you, and I use the baby or the, the child as a guide, and that is the real beauty of one-to-one. And, yes, everything I put out there, I do – I wouldn't create – I love creating and that creativity. I think Instagram lets me be really creative and create that content and things I really want to create, which I absolutely love but it literally scratches the surface of my knowledge and experience when it comes to sleep. And it's very general. It's not, it can be useful. It's useful to lots of families, but it doesn't give very specific sleep suggestions. Nothing actually beats talking to that person. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Cool. So if you don't have any questions about the theory of sleep and sleep in general, are you happy to crack on and work through her suggestions? Yes. This is the best bit, Abby. This bit always gets me a little bit excited. <laughs> so, have you, before we start, have you done any of my e-courses? Yes, I've done both of them. You've done both of them? Yeah. Lots of families come on to um, a consultation and, again, have done the e-courses. And, again, it's the same. I'm not going to go back over it because I really want to get cracking with your suggestions. But it's the same theory of the creating content for Instagram. Great starting place. Some families will make amazing progress from the e-courses alone. Brilliant. Where some families do need a little bit more support. And, again, it's quite natural to... Parenting is so personal. Sometimes it's hard not to internalize that as well I've done the e-courses it hasn't worked I felt I'm getting it all wrong but some families just need that little bit more support to bring it all together for them and sometimes it can be such a tiny thing that can make a big difference yeah definitely I think at the time when I bought the e-courses um the the first one I bought when I was I had I've got a little boy who's four and a half um so that was the first e-course but the second e-course um I think I just bought it for general knowledge. I don't feel like I needed any specific help at that time. Um, But then it did come in really useful as I was going back to work. Yeah. um, Because I was still breastfeeding um, and I work nights. So it was really good at kind of um, trying not to boob fear to sleep anymore. So it it was really, really helpful. Good. Very happy to hear that. Well, you'll be familiar. So when we're getting to settled night's sleep, everything all to your sleep aims. It doesn't matter really what we work. Well, it does matter what we're working on, but it actually it's it's applicable whether that's an early wake up, they're battling naps, they're battling bedtime, or such as yourselves want to reduce the wake ups at night time. Everything's linked with the everything. So food, diet, digestive system, going to the loo, um, sleep behavior you might have noticed yourself if you knock one of those off it can have a knock-on impact of everything else can't it you've probably yeah. seen that and it's the same with sleep everything is linked within sleep so for Thea her naps are linked to the night the nights are linked to the naps then you've got wake up time uh, first nap second nap third nap if she's having one bedtime routine 
what's happening at bedtime, bed, how we're setting her to sleep, what's going on overnight time. So it doesn't make sense to me just to focus down on one thing. For me, it makes sense to look at everything holistically because everything is linked. So I look at four, and actually it won't be just one thing. This is actually quite a common thing, is that I don't believe parents who you make mistakes but quite often when there's a sleep struggle we tend to do one of two things we either focus on one thing like if I settle the naps the night's going to come or if I nail bedtime that's going to work it's going to help with the night and sometimes it does if it was just that one thing but more likely it's going to be a combination of two or more things and the other thing is that the wake-ups at night time I always suggest to you to see try to see those as symptoms they're causing her wake ups at night time are causing you a sleepless night. It's very condescending of me to, to, to even say that because that's your reality. But they're causing you a sleepless night. They're tough and tiring, but they're not the cause of her sleepless night. They're some. It's some. It, they're a symptom of something that's coming up before that. So I have four sleep steps. Wait for it. I'm originally called my four sleep steps to settle my sleep. Are you familiar with these, Abby? Um. Yes. Think so. Yeah, I'll do a little summary. So these are naps and uh, naps and bedtimes, so the timings, bedtime routine, aka preparation for sleep separation, what we're doing at night time, our bedtime boundaries, and then supporting her to stitch her suit up at night time. And in all honesty, what we're going to do now is work through each one of her four sleep steps, find out what's working, what isn't working. Uh, we'll talk about each one and then I'll make my suggestions and what tends to happen is each family from each four sleep from each step most families will have anywhere between two and five sleep suggestions um, that then becomes at the end you'll have a whole list of sleep suggestions or your sleep plan I don't like the word sleep plan I don't know why but that's what most families um, come to know they like to call it that so that's your sleep plan and then yeah. it's up then it's about you guys putting it into practice, giving it patience, and hopefully that is going to work um, and move you towards a more subtle night's sleep. And then for some families, if this was a, um, like I offer two services. So, so I offer two services, one a call only, which is like what we're doing now, a one-off call, where there might yeah. be some follow-up or there would be some follow-up as well in it as well where we would check in and to be honest I value both of them some families have an initial chat like, like an initial consultation like this and then go on to make amazing progress some might need some follow-up where some families decide to work together for that for that two for that that two that chunk of time for those two weeks um, so the aftercare but I'll go through that at the end actually and and um what to do if it doesn't work but i think for now <clears throat> if you don't have any questions should we dig on through through her sleep steps for her yeah yeah definitely cool so let's start with naps she's on what actually let's start right back at the beginning what time is she up in the morning roughly it varies between five and maybe six past six six thirty Okay, let's that's talk about worry, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. to work. Okay. Um, what I would say about this is it is I don't believe that we're gonna do everything on the dot every single day. I really don't find we've got this expectation they're gonna wake up at the same time every day, nap, same time, same length, every day, behave in the same way every day, go to the bed, go to bed in the same way every single day. Yeah. And do you know what? Some babies do that. The majority don't. I've never looked after a baby that yeah. has done that. Every day they're different. They're not robots, are we? Nope, they're not. I call them little baby bed bots. No, they're not. <laughs> and so it's normal for their wake up time to be a little bit different every day. Yeah. And my suggestion would be, I wouldn't wake her up. Like it seems logical, doesn't it? Well, if that wake up time differs between an hour and a half, to wake her up in the middle of that so that she's waking up at a more consistent time. But I think that's already early enough anyway. So I'm not mm. gonna touch her wake up time, um, yeah. Abby. My suggestion would be to leave it as it is, and I'm hoping that as we get a little bit more consistency from her and her night settle, that gap will close down. So it might not be that she wakes up at 6.30 every day, 
but hopefully we can nudge that so that she's waking six six thirty instead of that swinging wildly by an hour and a half. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, and the the early mornings are, wouldn't be too bad if the nights were more settled. Yeah, you know, we don't mind getting up at kind of half five six. That's you know we've done that before, and it's I suppose as well because it's summer, it's a lot easier. But um, yeah, if if that was the only thing, then that would be fine. Yeah, no, that makes total, that makes total sense. So yeah, let's leave her bed the wake up time for now. And I'm really hoping that as we go through the process, that really early, like the extreme early waking, like 5 a.m., that yeah. that starts to close the gap rather than waking her up at six to make it more um, more consistent. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Cool. And then she's on two naps. Is she on two naps a day, or she recently transitioned to one? She has two naps a day, um, so she has one usually a couple of hours after she's woke um, and she might sleep this week and last week it was probably about an hour that she's had. The yeah. most that she would sleep would be two hours on the morning Yeah. Um, and then she has an afternoon nap usually about three hours from when she woke up from a morning nap. Yeah, cool. And how long was that one for Abby? Usually, maybe 40 minutes to an hour, an hour would be tops. Okay, there's lots of, it might not feel like it to you, Abby, um, what it might do, but there's lots of positives about her naps. She's having naps, which is always yeah. a positive in my bed book, always. Um, and I do feel she's hitting her nap needs during the day. Now, nap needs, how much nap? Their needs in a day will vary from hugely from baby to baby. I don't buy into this by a set age, they must sleep X amount during the day. Again, they are not baby bed bots. And I do believe that some babies have lower sleep needs than others, and some have higher sleep needs than others. And the best way to tell whether she's getting enough is look at her, her behavior during the day, what she's doing at night time. Um, you kind of have to zoom out and look at the bigger picture rather than just focusing down on the naps. So yeah. overall, I really think there's lots of positives about her naps and they're pretty much nailed. My only suggestion would be is that um, sometimes sleep can be a real chicken and egg situation where they wake up early. So if, say for example, she's up at five, that's going to lead to often quite, is going to lead to a um, early nap like at yeah. half seven half seven they'll want to sleep for quite a long time because they're tired they've been awake early which is tiring yeah. <coughs> sorry really bad hay fever there's a tree outside my office but if i don't have the window open i'm literally sweating so i'm either sweating <laughs> or um and yeah going back to naps um they have a really long morning nap, an early long morning nap, and then that can lead to a really long nap gap in the afternoon on a short nap. So I've got some, the overall her naps are nailed, I've just got some really tiny time tweaks that can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And my suggestions for her naps are, let's keep the wake up time, as I mentioned, to um, just letting her wake up whenever she's ready. And mm -hmm. I'm really hoping that as we go through the process, I'm ever the optimist, me, Abby, if that doesn't come across. I'm ever the optimist. <laughs> so I'm hoping that that 5 p.m., that 5 p.m., that 5 a.m. wake up starts to slowly get near a 6, 6.30 and it just closes yeah. the gap a little bit down. That first nap of the day, I would suggest, I would try and have that no earlier than 8.30 if you can. So regardless mm -hmm. of the day, the, the time she's woken up for the day, I would try and get that to 8.30. And if that feels like too much of a stretch, I would try to um, get it to 8.15, quarter past eight first, keep it there for three or four days, with my whole approach. Yeah make a tiny change, make one tiny change at a time, give it time, and then bump it to 8.30. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And the reason why is that otherwise we're getting, I was talking, before I started coughing, I think I was talking about that chicken egg situation where sometimes we just get caught up in early rise, early nap, long nap, early to bed, early rise, and we just get caught round in that cycle. So the key yeah. to moving forward is quite often just making very slight tweaks to their timings and that can make a difference. Does that make sense? It does, yeah, breaking the cycle. Yeah, and if, we go, if we're going to make a change, often doing it that first nap, it's better to stretch them at that first nap rather than the second nap. 
Okay. Because they've got the afternoon nap to catch up. Yeah. Smart. And the other thing that I was going to say, oh, it's gone now. That's annoying. <laughs> Ah, oh, that'll come back to me. So yeah, so but let's keep the wake up time as is. That first nap of the day, I would be aiming for around 8.30 at the earliest, regardless of the time she's woken up, if you can. If you need to nap, nap late in stages, that's what I would do. And this first nap, again, I'm really not a fan of waking a sleeping baby for so many different reasons, because... Yeah. I spend so long at my desk sweating coughing trying to get them to sleep it sounds ridiculous then to wake up but yeah. I would suggest capping that first nap an hour an hour and 15 minutes max just to even out her naps because there is absolutely nothing wrong with a long morning nap and for some babies that really works for them they have a long morning nap in the morning and then they have a short nap in the afternoon and then they go to bed and they sleep a set of night sleep however Thea is, this is pointing out the obvious here, isn't having a settled night's sleep. So mm -hmm. I think that is worth looking at. So cap that first nap at an hour, an hour and 15 max. And then in the afternoon nap, I would stick to the next nap around three hours, three to three and a half hour nap gap. And that's the one she can sleep for up to an hour and a half to two hours if she takes it. Oh, okay. Swap it around a bit. Interesting, yeah. I'm wondering whether she's just a little bit overtired to come bedtime. Yeah. Lock it up. So you said nap gap of three to three and a half hours. Yeah. And then a longer, a yeah. longer afternoon nap. Yeah. And then what time are you doing bedtime? Um, I mean, it does vary, but between between six and seven, um, she usually goes in the bath. And probably about half past five, quarter to six, straight after a tea, because she's usually blathered in whatever she's had to eat. Um, and then, yeah, the routine can take about half an hour, 45 minutes. So usually by half past six, we're, we're in her room starting to get her to sleep. Yeah. Aiming for us to be asleep by seven. Yeah. Okay, do you feel, I think... One thing that we want to, which I definitely feel is worth a mention, is that if they, but there's no one size anything for my approach, and I say one size sucks, and especially this is especially true at bedtime. I don't believe that every baby is capable of going to bed at 7 p.m. Um, and some babies do need a slightly earlier bedtime, some might need a slightly later bedtime, yeah. but from experience, I would try and avoid a really super early bedtime because for some little ones, if they go to bed, she might be ready to go to bed at 6, 6.30 because she's had a shorter nap in the afternoon. So she's had the longest gap with a short amount of nap in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, and that's having an impact on bed. So she'll be ready to go down to bed at 6, 6.30. But if they go to bed too early for some before 7, 7.15, that then can have an impact on them. Their, what happens is, is their melatonin sleep hormone quite, hasn't got quite got to its peak and they haven't built up enough pressure to keep them asleep. So actually sometimes going to bed can actually keep, um, fuel those wake ups at night time. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I'm a big fan of an early bedtime because for, the, for a lot of families that I see and talk to, like bedtime is quite late, but they're all, I think, they're all really different and I have a feeling for Thea I think what happens is she's up early so she's going to be tired she has quite an early um, nap it's quite long and she has a top up in the afternoon so come six some six six quarter plus that she is tired and she's ready to bed she go to bed but then because yeah. she's going to bed early I think that's playing a part in the frequent wake-ups and then the waking up early so the key yeah. to moving forward is making these tiny tweaks and making an adjustment so my suggestion I wouldn't go to bed any earlier than 6 30 if you can but have that okay. consistent point and my suggestion would be aim for 7 seven fifteen. yeah perfect does that sound about best for her it does yeah yeah we can like that's an easy tweak to make cool okay let me just do a little nap recap and then we'll go through it all so overall there's lots of positives about her nap she's having naps which is amazing 
I do think she's having, she's hitting her nap needs during the day. Um, just want to mention as well that napping in a pushchair, this is not an issue unless it's an issue for you. And naps don't have to be in a cot account. And I don't think I've, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I have never ever come back and looked at how they're going down for a nap to improve the not her going to bed and the wake ups at night time. I highly doubt she's waking up at night time going, I had a nap in a buggy. <laughs> what's going on what's the buggy because bedtime resets all of that so i just wanted to reassure you if that push chair if the nap in the push chair is working for you we definitely don't need to change that and i can't remember the last time i came back so i think it's pretty rare i do that so yeah. nap recap let's let her to leave her to wake up as normal and i'm really hoping that as we go through the process and she adjusts to her new routine that will close the gap down first nap of the day i would try to aim to make this no earlier than 8 30 if you can regardless of the time she's woken up for the day um if that feels too much of a stretch like she's waking up at five consistently and trying to get to 8 30 you're limping towards that 8 30 it's always okay. Routines don't need to be rigid. It's okay to roll with it. Bring it earlier by 10, 15 minutes and then slowly nudge it. And then this one, not a fan of waking and sleeping baby, but sometimes that is the key to getting on an even kill, keeping you yeah. on an even kill. Cap it at ideally 60 minutes, but an hour, an hour and 10, an hour and 15 maximum. And then second nap of the day, aim for around three to three and a half hours since waking. One thing to bear in mind is if she's sleeping less in the morning, she may need that nap a little bit before three hours. Just watch out, that's just something to be mindful and watch out for. <clears throat> and this is the one she can sleep up to one and a half to two hours if she takes it. I do not believe that long lunchtime nap needs to be two hours long. She might even just do another hour, an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, but at least yeah. the, <clears throat> it's more balanced and it's not like two hours in the morning and then half an hour in the afternoon i think two and a half hours is probably what she needs during the day um okay. but it's just balancing it out does that make sense oh and then bedtime no earlier than 6 30 um regardless of what's happening during the day but i would be aiming for 7 7 15. yeah brilliant <clears throat> how does that sound does that i think it's really important do you have any questions about naps no, I think it's achievable. Um, <clears throat> you've already answered the question that I had about um, whether it's okay for her to be in her push chair because I think in desperate times when I've struggled to get her down to sleep at bedtime, I've thought, is it because she's she is used to being um, she's used to going to sleep in the push chair? Um, but you've already answered that, so that's good. Yeah, I think if she's struggling to go to bed, I think that is likely to, it won't be what's happening at that no. bedtime battle. It will be before that. And that could be that she's had a really, quite often, um, if they have a really long morning nap in the morning, she might only have a really short afternoon nap, or she might have it really late. Or sometimes they'll skip that nap altogether, as they say, yeah. because they've had enough, is that resonating? They've had enough nap during the day, but it's just really yeah. early. So come bedtime, sometimes they can just be a little bit overwired and completely oversleep. So it's yeah. very likely to be that, it's to be the naps. And sometimes, um, this is care it out, so there's no control crying, not responding to them if they cry, anything like that. But quite often, um, I can't guarantee it's going to be completely tear free and that I'm just going to come in and it's just tear it out. It's going to be a piece of cake. Quite often there are changes to be made. I always want it to feel, I would never want you to do something you didn't feel uncomfortable with, Abby, ever. Mm. And quite often there is a period of adjustment because when we make any change, it takes a while for the rest of their body. Like if we're tapping them from that first nap, Sometimes they are going to get a little bit tired for the first couple of days. Like that's normal for there to be a period of adjustment, and for yeah. there to, to be a bit of a change, but give it time. And then within five to seven days, it usually levels out itself. And actually it then, it catches, everything else catches up on them. So they end up sleeping a bit later in, again, every option, they end up sleeping a little bit later in the morning. That has a knock on impact to the first nap, second nap. And hopefully that, I call it the sleep snowball, that just keeps having a knock on impact and it moves yeah. you forward. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you, Kerry. 
Cool. So any questions about naps? I think you said no. No, I don't think so. What do you think? Oh, maybe just one. What about like after 3 p.m.? This is known as the danger nap. Is that? That's Again, they're all really different. They're all really different. Um, I would probably say let's have a cap. Like I, whatever happens, I would probably suggest waking her up by quarter past three. Yeah. At the latest, cool. if we're aiming okay. for a quarter past half seven. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Super. So all the suggestions I've made about naps, they've all made sense. You don't have any questions, and you're happy with your suggestions. Yes, thank you. Amazing. How do you think she's going to respond to that? Did, did that resonate? I think she'll be fine. I think the, the first nap will tie in with um, the school run when that starts in September. Um, and then, yeah, the nap gap is fine. That's achievable. And then it will be interesting to see whether she has a longer afternoon nap. Um, yeah. I suppose it's difficult sometimes when you know, you've got things planned, you're going out for the day or you're going to be in the car for a long journey and you always start, well, me definitely, I start thinking, oh, you know, you can't fall asleep in the car and we'll turn the music up and put the windows down. <laughs> but yeah, like you say, not every day is going to be the same and, and they're not they're not robots. So no. as long as this is happening for the majority of the time, then I'm happy with that. Yeah, I totally agree. And life logistics, like life happens. We've got no control over it. You've got older children. It's, it, things will crop up. And again, it's yeah. always okay to roll with your routine. Nothing is very precise on my approach. So yeah. If you know you're going to be in the car, you've got a really busy afternoon, it's okay to give her a longer nap in the morning if she'll have it. And then a shorter yeah. one in the afternoon. But I think where you can, I think that is a sensible place to, to start with the naps. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Shall we crack on to bedtime routine? Yeah, let's go for it. Cool. First of all, how do you feel your bedtime routine? Now, I do separate out. So bedtime routine and bedtime boundary, how they go to sleep, linked 100%. Um, yes. And they are, um, you do them one after the other, but I do yes. separate them out. So bedtime routine is the prep step you do to get her ready for bed. And then yeah. the bedtime boundary, that's how you settle her to sleep. So the actual bedtime routine of getting her ready for, for bed, how do you feel that's going? I think it's okay. It could be better. But again, just life gets in the way. Me and my husband work shifts. And, yeah. you know, sometimes just, yeah, it just doesn't always go as, it's not as much of a routine as it could be. But then again, we do do the same things. She has a bath. Um, you know, we get her pyjamas on, um, she brushes her teeth, we read a book. Um, I think sometimes it's not always done um, within like a 45 minute period, for example. So I might bath her, bring her back downstairs and, you know, we might, I don't know, do a bit of this, do a bit of that, then go back up. So sometimes the routine can be broken a little bit. Um, yeah. But over, overall, we do do the same, the same steps. Yeah. I, I always ask how it's working for you because you're always the most important person. But I completely agree with you. I really like her bed, a bedtime routine. And again, lots of positives here. You've got a bedtime routine, which is always, again, a positive in my bed book. You're doing yeah. the same things in the same order-ish. I love that word, ish, every single day, <laughs> which helps Thea to anticipate what's happening. She knows what's coming. She can expect it. That can really help um, with settling her down to sleep at night time. And the, at the end, at, at, after her bedtime routine, for the majority of the time, she is falling asleep. So we know that that's working as well. So the bedtime routine, I'm a massive fan as if, it, if it's not broken, I'm not going to come in and fix it. I wouldn't make changes just for the sake of making changes. I would only suggest something if I was quite confident if we were going to move forward with it. So the, your base of your bedtime routine, I think, is really solid, and I'm not going to come in and change that. The only suggestion I would make would be to start the bedtime routine a little bit later. Um, I didn't talk about this in the bedtime routine, but sometimes she does take a while to fall asleep. Um, mm -hmm. And that quite often, again, it can be a real, babies can be a real balance, because 
yes we don't want them overtired because that can have an impact on sleep but also we also and i know i don't help that so i talk about overtiredness quite a bit but we also want to make sure that they've got enough i call it tired in their tank enough peak pressure to actually get to sleep when we put them down for bed um and i think with thea I can't decide at the moment whether I think it go one of two ways. I, I actually think it can be a bit of both. I think on some days when she's had a really short nap in the afternoon, I think she is tired and that's why mm-hmm. she gets a little bit um get a little gets a little, little bit sleep silly. But then some days she'll have quite a late nap in the in the evening and then that is gonna have an impact. Sleep is a biological process. If they are not ready, they don't have enough pressure to get to sleep or they're not ready, no amount of patting coaxing patting the bum bum drum is going to get mm-hmm. them to sleep they're not going to go until they're ready so i think all the um the tiny tweaks that we've made to her naps can make a really big difference um, and actually i've just remember what i was going to say coming back to the naps is that cons- lots of families talk about consistency they say i oh, carry i want consistency give me consistency but actually babies by nature are very inconsistent we don't all do things the dot on the daily but also um consistency actually comes from us rather than them we've got more control over when we put them to sleep how long they nap for does that make sense yeah yeah it does so my suggestions for the bedtime routine is that i would be aiming for the bath around 10 to 6 6 o'clock at the earliest okay uh into her bedroom to get her nappy, pajamas on, brush her teeth, and read a book. Yeah. Um, do you feed it in her room or your room? I've got myself in in my room. And then you go back into her room. Yeah, this is a problem, isn't it? No, not necessarily. Um, okay. Ideally, but and again, there isn't this one size. They all must go into their own room after after they've um, had their pajamas on and their nap or they must stay there because sometimes there are just lots of things to take into consideration. Other children, mm. size of the flat, where they have their bath, yeah. like life isn't all, this is what's got to happen. Yeah. So I think if she has the, um, she's used to having the boob in your bed and then she walks happily into your bedroom, I wouldn't mm. change that unless we absolutely have to. I don't foresee that being a problem. Oh, that's good. Um, so yeah, I would have the bath at around 5.50, 6 o'clock, 10, 15 minutes, let her splash, kick, work, do whatever she needs to do in the bath. I would probably just put a little time limit on it so she doesn't go too, too crazy. Then mm-hmm. into her bedroom, get a nap in pyjamas on, brush her teeth and read a book. Um, then I would go into, actually, I'm wondering, sorry, sometimes this happens, we go backwards and forwards a little bit. I think my suggestion, actually, a little bit of a tweak around. So bath at 5.56 o'clock, mm-hmm. into her bedroom to get her nappy and pajam- baby grow on, or you could do them in the bathroom. Then I would um, go into your bedroom, have the have the breastfeed find bunnies Mm. then i would go back and brush her teeth on the way into back into her bedroom actually then read then into her bedroom and then Mm. read a book in her room she got books in her bedroom yeah yeah a couple of books a couple of books in her bedroom then her teething granules if she's teething and then the other thing that I would introduce is saying goodnight to three or four things in the same order every single night. So just pick three or four okay. things in her room. This is a cl- care it out, absolute classic. This <laughs> by accident and it just become definitely a classic here at Care It Out. But I call it the blast off to the bed or the countdown clock, depending on where they're sleeping. One, it's a really nice thing to do. It's fun. The first time you do it, you'll probably feel what on earth is going on. Um, you'll feel a bit silly. But you do it again and again. Thea's bright. She'll start looking, waving, blowing kisses, goodnight to everything. It's a really mm. fun thing to do. Yeah. Um, and also, it's helping set up that cue for someone else to put her to bed as well. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Yeah. And then I would settle her, which I'm going to come on to in a second. Okay. 
no, let me go through that again. Sorry, sometimes it is quite tough when I think things out in my head. I'm thinking, how can we stream, get it to work for you and streamline? So let me go through this and let's see if I can remember this. So bath at around 5 56 pm for 10 yep. 15 minutes. Been to her bedroom, nappy and pajamas on. Mm. Then into your bedroom, find the bunnies, have a breastfeed, bunnies and breastfeed. Yeah. Back into the bathroom brush teeth, into her bedroom, then this is the most, the, the once she's in her room, I think having some time in her room, I think will help settle her. She sounds mm -hmm. like, I'm not assuming to know her, but she sounds like a busy little bee. So I think going straight into her bedroom and then expecting her to be able to just go, right, sleep tight. I think having some time in her room will mm -hmm. help slowly wind her down a little bit. So then mm -hmm. back into her bedroom, she can read a book or, and sing some sleep songs together have a cuddle, have some teething granules, say goodnight, do three or four things, and then we'll go through settling to sleep in a second. Yeah, lovely. Cool. So it's the same thing with the naps, with the bedtime routine. Has that all made sense? It has. Amazing. Are you happy with the suggestions? Do you see it working for you? Or do you feel yeah. that changing it around is just complicated things? No, no, I think it'll work. Like... Just knowing what you what you suggest um, before we've done this, like trying to like stay within within one room rather than going all over. Um, and yeah, like anybody listening yes. is absolutely fine to spit rooms. I just think her bedtime routine is pretty nailed. I think just having some things to do in her bedroom once she goes in, I think it will just consolidate it last little bit yeah it will because we often go into a brother's bedroom and yeah so like you say being in her bedroom knowing that's what that that's where she's going to go to sleep is yeah it's good yeah it makes sense and then any other questions about bedtime routine no i don't think so amazing happy to go on to bedtime boundaries yeah this is often the biggie. There's a lot that says if in order to get them to sleep well at night time, they need to skip their sleep cycles together. Um, I don't buy into the, again, one size up. For every baby needs to put themselves to sleep for it to work. I think there are some really tiny tweaks from her naps that can make a big difference. And I think, and I'm just going to triple check this actually, she falls asleep on the cot and you pat a bum yeah yeah so um i actually lay in the cot with her um and um yeah just wrestle with her for a few minutes <laughs> while she arrives around the cot standing up sitting down pulling at the curtains getting me to kiss the bunnies blah 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 and then eventually she'll think actually i'm tired and she'll lay down and then i bop a bum before she goes yeah. to sleep so when you say get in the cot, is it a cot with the size up or is it a cot bed? So it is a cot bed, sorry. So one of the sides is down um, and the, the, other, the side that, that's up is against a wall. Okay, that makes sense. My, I mean, again, there's lots of positives here. Always look for the positives. She is falling asleep where she wakes up. She falls asleep in the cot bed, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah. With the padding. My suggestions for her bedtime boundary, again, I think there are positives. She's falling asleep in her bed. She's waking up where she falls asleep, which, for not, again, yeah. it's not a one size fits all, but for some babies, that really can make a difference. But yeah. I think the first step would be to just get, again, nobody, both dad and you, are never going to be able to settle her in exactly the same way because two people no. are possible for two people to do things in exactly the same way every single time. That's impossible. But my suggestion would be, let's see whether you can settle her from outside of the bed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because when she wakes up at the moment, if she falls asleep with you laying next to her in the bed, when she wakes up, there's quite a few changes when she does her change checks. Yeah. One, she's, you're not in the bed. That can often be a biggie. And she's not being patted. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
So my suggestion, and it, it might feel a little bit overwhelming and a little bit scary at first, and again, wouldn't want you to do something you don't feel comfortable with. And at any time she asks for support, we're always going to give it to her. Yeah. But I do feel that first step is to very slowly give her the time, lots of time, and give her lots of support to get to the point where she's falling asleep with you outside of the bed with the patting. Yeah. And I always, when we're changing bedtime boundaries, my whole approach is to do it slowly. One, because I don't buy into that every baby has got to fall asleep in their sleep space with a parent out of the room for six sleep no. cycles. Some, for some babies, it's just enough for them to fall asleep next to the cot. Some, it's enough to stop the patting. Some families, in order, we do get to the point where we slowly work our way out of the room. And that can feel really overwhelming. How on earth do you go from where we are now with you in the getting in? And by the way, you're not the only person that gets into the cot. It wasn't like I just want to really reassure you that there is nothing wrong with that. And if that was working for you, we didn't we never need to stop that. It's just when something isn't quite working for you, that's when we can very slowly start to unpick it a little bit. So my whole approach isn't to go from right, do it all, go gung ho and do it all in one go. So to go from going from falling asleep with you in the cot together, patting, to then you leaving the room, which again not every baby will need to do that but for some we do get to that point that can feel really overwhelming so my whole approach is to step it down a little bit more we don't go right there you're going to fall asleep in your cot mummy's going to leave the room we make what again it comes back to make one change at a time give it time yeah. so that first step i sometimes be very much overcomplicate things myself included that first step is really simple and the first step would be to just support her to fall asleep with you outside of the bed. So what that looks like is you do a little change to the naps, the bedtime routine is normal, and then um, get the bunnies. I would encourage, you know, kiss the bunnies tonight, uh, give the bunnies a big kiss, and then I would sit right up next to the cot and yeah. then cuddle her and pat her off to sleep. And I just want to reassure you that the cot cruising, I love that phrase. Mm -hmm. Cock cruising is completely, brilliant. yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? And it describes exactly what they're doing. It Moving does. around the car, putting on a sleep show, <laughs> flapping around. My, I think you can't really summarise Care It Out because there's so many layers to it. But in a nutshell, my approach is always, it doesn't matter what we're working on, but especially bedtime boundaries, is to always give them that practice and patience, that the sleep space to put themselves to sleep. So if they're not asking for support, they are emotionally easy, they're just flapping around, no crying, emotionally easy. My suggestion would be to always give them that respect that sleep space to either put themselves to sleep or go back to sleep but if they're asking for support we're always going to give them that support every yeah. single time it's not soft it's not spoiling them care it out is the exact opposite of control crying every time they ask we go to them and it builds yeah. that trust we have to trust that um well we you have to trust that if they need you they're going to ask it's not about coaxing or cajoling them to sleep and we have to trust that if they're going to um no you have to trust that if she's going to need you, she's going to ask for support often louder. Yeah. Yeah. Bad you gone. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. You went off a little bit there, but yeah, it does. Cool. You're back. Back. I don't know what happened there. That's strange. So my suggestion would be then, so do your normal bedtime routine, encourage um, the bunnies, you can kiss the bunnies, put them into bed, get the bunnies into bed, get Thea to fall asleep, get, get Thea into bed, and then I would sit right next to it and to begin with, I would just pat her, give her that, I, I quite like the idea of letting her cruise around the cot until she gets, you know, she gets a little bit tired pat her off once she gets to that point pat her all the way off to sleep that's your first yeah. step does that make sense it does yes thank you now i know i've made that sound ridiculously simple <laughs> it doesn't always in theory it sounds very <laughs> simple it doesn't always go like that two things to um to think about here is when we make a change so even though it's a very small change she's still being patted to sleep she's still falling asleep with you next to her we're just out of the bed it's still yeah. a change change is strange you're not in the bed with her so two yeah. things is 
here is to expect that it's going to take long, long time to settle her. I would brace yourself for an hour, an hour and 15 the first night. It can take, any change is strange. Change takes time. So it, it's natural. It makes sense to me that if she will make a change, it's going to take her longer to get to sleep. And it is completely normal that if they're taking longer to get to sleep, that you're going to worry that they're getting overtired, it's not working, they're never going to fall asleep. Now, if she's getting upset, she's get, it's not working, my suggestion would be to get back into bed with her. Like, if she's really going for it and you feel like you've got nowhere else to go, I think it's yeah. unlikely, to be honest, but again, you know more better than anybody, then I would park it. But if she's doing, like, it's just taking time, um, and she calms when you're patting and cuddling her, then my suggestion would be to try and keep going. And that time it takes, that first night may, might take 40, 50 minutes, but the next night, the more we do it, the more familiar it becomes, the more practice we get, the more proficient we get at it. Yes. That time is very likely to come down quite quickly, where you get to that point where you're able to just put her into the bed and then she'll fall asleep with you next to the bed. With the padding and then if we need to then we can very slowly start to remove the padding yeah that's fine because to be honest it takes that long to get her to sleep now before we've made these changes so it's not going to add any extra time hopefully to the you know to the routine at the moment yeah makes sense and then the next thing that once you've done that i think that i do feel that's a big enough change to start with but after yeah. that my suggestion then would be to very slowly reduce the amount of patting she's getting. So again, it's the same theory. We always give them what she wants and needs, the patting if she needs it, but we're always giving her that practice and patience to do the next step that we would like her to do, i.e. fall asleep without the patting. So yeah. my suggestion would be to do the changes to the naps first, because I think they're the biggie. Do the new bedtime routine, work on settling her to sleep outside of the bed first using patterns so we change the pattern all the way to sleep assess it see what's working what isn't see whether you need a tweak and if the nights haven't settled which is completely normal it just means that we might need to do more work on the bedtime boundary then we can very slowly start to reduce the pattern um, and the way i would suggest to do that is to give her once she can fall asleep she can fall asleep with you outside of the bed my suggestion would be to, once you got her into the bed, I'd give her a little pat to get her on her way, but then I would stop, I would just sit next to the bed. Let her cock cruise, if she's not crying, she's emotionally easy, I would just leave her there, we don't need to do anything, we just sit by the bed, she doesn't need any shushing or reminders to go to sleep. If she gets upset, she starts crying, she gets emotionally easy, we're gonna make eye contact if we can, say a little sleep sentence, pat her until she's almost asleep but not quite, Stop yeah. patting, give her that practice and patience to fall asleep by herself. If she gets upset, emotionally uneasy, pat, 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 pat. Until she's almost asleep but not quite, stop, give her that practice and patience. Do you see where we're going with that? So we're always giving what she needs to patting, yeah. but we're also practicing out doing what we would like her to be, what we would like her to do, fall asleep without the patting. Yeah. That's good. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, it does. And I think for now, I, that's two big changes. Well, actually, three or four big changes, including the naps and the bedtime routine. I do feel that's enough changes for now. And my suggestion would be to see how you get on with that lot first. Yeah, um, okay. And then we can always have a, a like a follow up, or like some families would need a little bit of follow up. I'm always very honest and upfront if it was a one off call. Yeah. Some families, I'm not. I don't want to run my business where I'm constantly in your inbox. Do you want more follow up? Do you need something else? But I yeah. always let families know that I'm here if you need me, but you can always book in. But again, I'm ever the optimist. I'm really hoping that some of these suggestions help and really ease up the frequent wakings at night time and yeah. we'll see how we get on. Yay! I hope Yay. So. Do you have any other questions? Does everything I've just gone through about bedtime boundaries make sense? It does, yeah, yeah. And I think they are, you know, little tweaks that hopefully are going to make a difference. And I think I'd just like to say that the, we've come such a long way already from, um, you know, like we used to, we did co-sleep and we did boob to sleep and, and all these things have changed gently over the last kind of 
um, well, since April, since I went back to work. So for some parents that are listening, it probably sounds like this is quite an easy thing to do, these couple of tweaks, but it, it has been ongoing before this and just to, yeah, yeah. we're all kind of together in this and it, it is really hard, but we can all help each other out, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's like lots of families get to that point where it just it isn't working. They either get to the point where they need a little bit of support or it's taking some time to get there. Yeah. But I honestly believe that any pro like progress is progress and some little ones do just take a little bit longer to get there, but they do yeah. they do get there. And sometimes it is constantly working on those little tweaks and and, and, and Ooh, that was um, sorry about that if you can hear that. Um but yeah, it's completely I think people sharing that I think that's really important for other families to be like it is hard and reaching out to support is really hard to do. Um but yeah, I'm really hoping some little tweaks can make a big difference. Fingers crossed. Fingers I'm excited. Crossed. <laughs> me too. Me too. So you don't have any. Uh, I think at this point, you it's all made sense. Yeah. You're happy with the suggestions because that's really important. If I came in and made massive changes and it just felt overwhelming and you couldn't see how those changes were going to be made, chances are we're not going to get very far because it just feels too overwhelming. You have to make those changes easy to begin with. And yeah. then once we get started, work on the on the bigger stuff if we need to. Um, yeah. And you've had all your questions answered. Yes, definitely, definitely. Amazing! I knew this was going to go over. I was like, we're going to keep it to an hour, short and sweet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's always the way we always go over. But I do feel that it. Well, hopefully, it was helpful to you, and I'm really hope, really hoping. That it will be helpful to someone else as well listening. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure it will be. Amazing. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Will you keep me posted, Abby? What I'm going to do I is will. I'll send you, this will be out next Tuesday. I'm actually going to send you the recording before then. So you've got it. Okay. Refer, but I don't know if you're making notes, but you've got it to refer back to. Yeah. And yeah, maybe we can catch up in a, in a couple of weeks and see where you're at. Definitely, would love that, Kerry. That would be brilliant. Oh, it's amazing. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking at you, <laughs> as I like to say. I always feel like that the balance is, I don't know, like I have so much to say, it's hard trying to get that balance. But it was really lovely speaking to you, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to what these little suggestions bring. Yes, thank you so much, Kerry. You're welcome. We'll Take talk. care. You too. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to me, your host, Kerry Secker, on the Carrot Out Sleep Show. I really hope you found the podcast reassuring, informative, and a little bit fun. If you did, please don't forget to subscribe to the show below, and I'd be so grateful if you could leave me some fabulous feedback. I always love hearing from you, and one lucky listener will win lifetime access to my Bedtime Basics e-course every single month. My next podcast episode will be out in two weeks' time, but if you can't wait for more of my sleep shizzle, you can find me over on Instagram at Carrot Out Sleep Consultant. I update my sleep squares and speak sleep there on the daily. Big love and sleep solidarity to you all.